can't hear what's going on. It's Paul Sunday today, and uh, we just want to uh, really appreciate what they've done by sacrificing oh, because of this. We apologize for dragging you guys here because it wasn't a last minute thing. But anyway, um, do you want to open in prayer if that's okay? Sure. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for this day, Lord. This is the day that you have made, and we are rejoicing, and we're glad in it, Lord. Father God, we just pray that you would watch over this meeting today, Lord God. Father God, we pray that you would give these ladies, fill them full of wisdom and direct them, Lord God. Father God, I pray that you open up the hearts and the minds of all the people here, that they would hear what they're meant to hear, that they would ask the questions that need to be asked. And Father, we just thank you in advance for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, now, okay. um, each candidate will get three minutes to introduce themselves, and then I've got about four questions that I'll ask, and they each have two minutes to respond. And any, at any time, if they have a question for one another, the other candidate, they can raise their hand. Um, after that, then we'll open up the floor. If you could line up orderly, and uh, you can have the microphone and ask them each a question. Uh, anyway, we're about ready to get. Did anybody have any questions? Okay, uh, let me start by saying this. My first question: It's frustrating for me to watch a lot of the primaries. I watched three of the governor primary debates, where the candidates spend much of their time telling us how they'll do a better job than their likely opponent in the general election. Now it's a given that either one of you two ladies will be a vast improvement over the Secretary of State that we currently have. So, having said that, however, at this juncture, neither of you are running against Steve Simon. Eventually, one of you will be, will get the nomination, but what we need to know today is why you feel you'd be a better, do a better job than the lady sitting next to you. I'm sorry, I forgot. You guys each get uh, three minutes. Uh, we never put the point or anything, so. Um, you want to go first, Kim? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I said you didn't get <coughs> Three minutes is always such a short time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me say that I took some prayer to agree to be here on Palm Sunday. Uh, I had that conversation with the Hexums. Um, but we did have a, a beautiful drive up after church today uh, and appreciate that what we're trying to do is heal our state uh, and heal our nation just as Jesus did in the temple when the Pharisees gave him a hard time. So I brought my palm with me, it's in the back, uh, and uh, look out over uh, your happy faces and appreciate you being here. Um, I'll give you a brief bio, um, but first I want to leave with why I'm running for Secretary of State. I brought a book with me called Rigged by Molly Hemingway. Uh, election integrity has become a passion of mine. I wouldn't call it end of career, but kind of a topper. After decades uh, as a corporate attorney, a small business owner, an executive at several conservative think tanks devoted to a return to constitutional uh, rule and the rule of law, uh, and getting frustrated uh, as an advocate for a return to our Judeo-Christian roots. Um, it's great to read, write, be on the radio, uh, and be a great advocate for those things, but I came to the conclusion after watching what happened in 2020 that I needed to get, really get into the arena. And we'll go into some detail this afternoon on what I saw Steve Simon do in 2020. It happened across the country, um, but this is where I live. I am a fifth generation Minnesotan, and I want to grow old here. Uh, we all have maybe an exit plan in the back of our minds because our taxes are abusive, our government is incompetent, right? But most importantly, we feel that our civic right to have free and secure elections has been violated over and over and over again. How many of you are here because of election integrity issues? And this is what we see across the state, from convention to convention, uh, including yesterday in Duluth and down in Lakeville. So this has become my passion 
after a 30 plus uh, year career as a lawyer, um, small business owner, uh, and advocate. It's time to get in there and get dirty and fight. Um, and that's why I'm running for Secretary of State. And just a brief overview of the credentials that I bring to not only win, but to be a great Secretary of State. So thanks for having me, and I look forward to your questions, Mr. Hexum, and the audience. Thanks. Secretary of State because our future depends on it. It's pretty simple. How many of you like the results that we have in St. Paul? No. <laughs> How many of you think we can do better? Yes. Yes. How many of you want the same thing that we've had cycle after cycle after cycle? No. no. How many of you are ready for a fighter? Yes. <laughs> okay. But then let's start there. I'm going to give you a quick bio of myself. I'm Kelly John Byrne. I'm a blue collar kid from South St. Paul. I've never had anything handed to me. We've had our late place up here in, the, in God's country for more than 20 years. We have a place on Lake Ida. This is my happy place. This is my place to escape. And it's where I did escape to during COVID because somebody told us that we had to be locked into our house and locked in and masked up and all this other stuff. And like everyone else, you all looked around and you were like, hmm, I trust the government. I don't trust the government any further than I could throw all of them. You see, I was on the ballot in 2020. My husband just became a U.S. citizen. John and I have been married for almost 25 years. He never voted in any election because only U.S. citizens are voting in American elections. Right? Right. <laughs> right. So, I was asked to run in 2002. That's when I dipped my 35-year-old little toe into the arena. I ran a statewide campaign, not because I wanted to, but because I went through the endorsing process and I didn't get the nod. My good buddy got the nod. And so what I did is I helped to work on that campaign. But within weeks, I was recruited to run a statewide campaign, and that was for the last Secretary of State that we had that was a Republican. Had a great candidate, amazing candidate. But this is the problem between then and where we're at now. Where we're at now is Republicans have been a bit asleep at the wheel. How many of you agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in the process of that, running, making a little money, having my son when I was 40, going through all the motions, working on some campaigns, being involved in my BPOU, how many of you can relate to all that stuff? There came a time, they asked me in 2006 to run and I didn't. I was 40 years old. Elections in November, election day is in November. My baby was due in December. I said, I can't do that. I'm super woman, I think, sometimes. But that wasn't an opportunity. In 2020, the opportunity came up and I seized it. It was actually in 2019. I buried both my parents in 2020. COVID shut us all down on March 17th, the day my mother died. We had to figure out how to run an election. We raised a lot of money. We door knocked 12,000 doors. Who knew that Steve Simon would cheat because he's such a quiet, honest guy? Well, he did cheat. And there's a name that y'all should know. Her name is Sarah Brewing. You know who she is? She was Amy Klobuchar's political director, and she was the judge that signed off on the consent decree. One was in June, July, and August. Mad? Yeah, man, I door knocked 12,000 doors while my boys were up here. I went back to the cities to go door knock and do what I needed to do. I was in the fight. If we can't win, we need to change the course of action. Because what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result with just different players. We need less politicians and we need less of legalese and we need more, take action, and let's get it done. And that is why I'm running for Secretary of State. I have a 15-year-old son. I have a brand new US citizen. And I'm an American citizen that is watching America go down the toilet. And I'm tired of it. And if you're tired of it, maybe that's the candidate that you might like. I'm Kelly John Byrne, and I'd be appreciative of your vote 
I'm happy to answer your questions. If I don't know the answer, I'm not gonna blow smoke up your butt and tell you that I know the answer when I don't. Because running this election as the CEO, Chief Election Officer, you should be running the business of elections. Not partisan, but the business of election. One vote, one person, one eligible voter, one American citizen, period. Thank Kelly, you. you. Kelly, you can sit there. You can go first. You guys will alternate. You can ask okay. the first question right now. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm on the first question? You're on the okay. first question. Then, then, then you rotate like that. Okay. okay. Um, so I had already asked my first question basically before I announced you guys. I forgot. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was a lot of minutes yeah. that expired in between. <laughs> so anyway, um, eventually the one you two will be running against, Steve Simon. And we, probably most of us here, believe that either one of you two will be a vast improvement over him. But we're not at that juncture today. We're here to decide which one of you two we want to support. So if you could tell us in two minutes the difference between you two, why you would be a better candidate than, than your opponent. Let, let's just start off with the human condition here. Nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody's better than anybody else. Right now, we have a lot of candidates running for many offices. So I think we should all applaud that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, it takes a lot of courage to get up and do this, does it not? Yeah. Who doesn't agree with that? Yeah. But at the end of the day, you have to decide who you want to represent you. So I'm not going to go down the road of who is better, because that's just not the way I roll. Right. Who's going to get the job done? I told you in the beginning, I'm a business owner. For 31 years, I've run a business. I worked for 20 years in the corporate world. I look for people that are qualified that can get the job done. I don't look at how many degrees you have because there's a lot of people that have more degrees than Fahrenheit that are flipping burgers at McDonald's. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying just because you have a degree in brain surgery, I don't want to be your first one. <laughs> Credentials are this. We need a candidate that knows how to communicate with people on many different levels. I've been a global sales director for the second largest hotel company in the world. 5,000 properties traveled all over the world for them. I've worked with people of color, of different culture. Do you think we are going to get across the finish line with Republicans only? If you do, you're, in the, you're, you're over here somewhere, because we're not. We have to get people up and off their bottoms to get out and vote. Do you know how we win? It's we have a candidate that is relatable that can win. But let's talk about some credits. I have a background in marketing. I'm a business coach. I've taken two businesses from zero to a million. I've raised $3 million for more than 30 nonprofits. Yes, as Mrs. Minnesota. I've spoken in all 87 counties for something. I've done a million dollars for my own nonprofit. You're going to have to have a candidate that can raise funds. And right now, these down ballot races need help. We need a candidate that has not only the statewide experience, but the business operations experience to run the business of the election fairly and freely in a nonpartisan way. I check all of those boxes. That's period. That's it. All right, thank you. Kim, uh, I'll ask you the same question. This is actually how I got worded here, so to make it uh, correct, why do you feel that you would do a better job in your opponent as a Secretary of State, not a better person, but a better job? I appreciate your approach. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. I think that's an important question. I think what distinguishes my campaign, if you will, from all the others right now, and I include uh, gubernatorial and AG uh, candidates in that, is that Republicans have a tendency to focus on more than like Republicans have a tendency to focus on campaigns. Democrats focus on elections and the operations of elections. And what's been missing from Republican uh, strategy, if you will, is strategy. So I'm the only candidate thinking strategically to figure out how the heck we beat Simon, not in 2023 we get him, 
this year, right now, in 2022. What's he doing to rig the system that we can interrupt? How do we throw sand into his gears? So one of the things I've been working on for months is recruiting election judges to put eyes on every ballot. You may have heard me talk about my Virginia plan for Minnesota. My credentials, and I can list them, they're long, they go over 30 years, got me invited to an election integrity network. We meet twice a week. It's a national group, very powerful. <coughs> they helped flip Virginia from blue to red, and I saw how they did it, though I didn't go out there because I was getting married. They put eyes on every ballot. Republicans have been asleep at the wheel for years. They used to cover about 20% of the polls, and I just talked to Don and some other people about this for Otter Tail. They hit 93% of the polls last Virginia. That's how they won. So I've been recruiting with the help of Patriot groups, and you guys can help me, to put eyes on every ballot in 2022. Also, I will call out Steve Simon. I want to debate him. I want to challenge him. I've been writing about it and advocating on the radio and the Star Tribune and other places that will publish me like American Greatness on how he rigged the election. He let Zuckerbuck's into our state. He cut a deal with Mark Elias from the DNC to do what? Change our election laws without the nuisance of legislation, right? Extending the election by a week, waiving critical uh, safeguards for absentee ballots. And he did that in court, in Ramsey County Court. And he also has been excluding citizen election judges from the ballot boards. What percentage of the vote in 2020 was by absentee or mail-in ballot? Who knows? 58%. 58% because you've heard me before in Alexandria maybe. Six out of 10 votes, folks. So the reason why my campaign doesn't just matter to the Secretary of State's race, it matters to the entire ticket. And I'll be happy to share specific credentials with you uh, as our discussion goes on. Thanks. Okay, can you just next question? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. So this is something that I've been thinking about all along. We have all, all of the way along, we have all had the power to put eyes on every ballot. Right now, I'm just saying 58% voted absentee. Right now, because of this uh, January, whatever the date was, January 4th, I was at the Supreme Court, listened to the oral arguments. So the law, if, I, if I've got this right, and I'm not a lawyer, but I, but I might have this right, right now, as the law stands, it's okay to have these uh, um, County of uh, people uh, looking at the ballots. So eyes on every, my question is, is, we can have eyes on every ballot, but you've always had the opportunity to have eyes on every ballot. It's called your own. So my question is, is what ballots are we going to have eyes on? Absentee ballots? Live ballots? Which ballots? That's my question, is if we have eyes on every ballot, that's what I'm just confused on. And maybe I don't understand, but I, I want to understand. Eyes on every ballot, what does that actually mean? Kim, would you like to address that? Sure. Um, well, there's a bunch of different categories of voting. Um, the Democrats have made voting very chaotic and very expensive over the last decade or more. You have election day voting. Uh, which frankly is the most secure way to vote. And I recommend that we return to the civic traditions that we yes. Arrange your life to be home on election day. And if you can't do that in Minnesota, we have something called direct balloting, where you can go into your city hall, get a ballot, and feed it into a tabulator yourself. That's kind of the second best. And I do that because I've been an election day Attorney for the party for over 20 years. The question is, yes, I'm getting to which it eyes on which ballots? Yeah, well, your eyes are on that ballot, right? Um, the count is actually has the most integrity at that level because you end up on election day with what? 
a, a Democrat and a Republican sitting across from each other, especially if you guys show up. Like I said, in Virginia, Republicans didn't used to show up. When I was down in Blue Earth County, I was shocked when I found out that the precincts weren't being covered by Republicans. And maybe that's true in Otter Tail too. So the eye, that's the eyes on every ballot that you guys can cover. And that's an easy one, because Simon hasn't figured out a way to exclude us from that yet. The other categories are absentee. And that's where it's tricky. He's been telling the county auditors for years, oh, you don't have to follow the party balance rule and have Republicans and Democrats looking at those ballots and accepting and rejecting them. He's been, he's been excluding us to exclude, what, Republicans, right? To exclude conservatives and get that balance. So the Minnesota Voters Alliance sued him. And um, because the statute, well, if you read the whole damn thing, you would conclude that party balance, the party balance rule was actually required. But the Minnesota Supreme Court kind of split the baby, and they said, you have to meet the party balance rule, but only when you're comparing signatures on absentee ballots. And that doesn't come up all that often. So it was a very limited victory a while, a while ago. Um, we are still working on that at the Republican Party to get Democrats and Republicans back on those ballot boards. A recent fly in the ointment, which we kind of predicted, is a vaccine requirement for the county boards, but don't give up. We may have multi-state litigation, we're trying to get into federal court. I don't like litigation, but don't give up on that. Just stay tuned. If you sign up for my emails, I, I addressed it on Friday, um, and on Justice and Drew last week, I'll keep you in the loop. So that's what eyes on every ballot means. And there's also, you know, veterans. Another one is nursing homes, folks. Yes. Be on top of that. Be on top of that for your people who are in nursing homes. So I just have a question, and I don't know if this and is going. I don't going know what your question was, sir. But is she going to run the debate? Or <laughs> or <are you> gonna... <laughs> no, but my question is, is I asked a simple question, and I got a marketing thing, and this is what I find. This is what I hate about politics. Yeah. You ask a simple question, and you get a legalese question. I asked a simple question. Eyes on which ballot, and I'd like to just have a speak if I, if I can at all. If if this is if, if if I can have any time, I'm not a lawyer, but I think I get some time. So my question is: is if we are going to have eyes on every ballot, I asked a simple question. How many of you know which ballots your eyes are on? Great, lots of hands. The eyes on every ballot is a great idea. It's a great idea. The challenge is, we don't have to participate in 47 days of voting. Nobody has a gun to your head. Nobody's telling you that you have to go and do a mail-in ballot. By law, right now, you don't need to be a lawyer to know this, just go read election law. It's right in the Secretary of State's office. It says that if you wanna vote in person, whether Ida Township or any township, tells you that they're gonna mail in ballots, you can say, mm, I'm not doing that, and you can show up and demand a ballot, and the county clerk's gotta take it, but don't do it any day before election day, because then they can start counting them. So the only eye that you need on the ballot is show up yourself, encourage your neighbors, and have your own eye on your own ballot on election day. Okay, so I understand you have, you want Kim to answer this question for more specifically. Well, I think she's, I think she's gone and, and given us the marketing plan for eyes on every ballot, but I did, I've never got the question. <coughs> Go ahead, would you like to address that? that I'll ask I, did answer, I did answer. I did answer. Yeah, she did answer the question. This is, a, this is an intelligent audience. I, I have another point to make. If you live in greater Minnesota, since Steve Simon became Secretary of State, he's gone from about 600 townships that were mail balloting to 1,345. You cannot vote in person in those mail ballot townships where you only get a ballot if you're a registered voter unless you drive to the county seat on election day. How far away is the county seat from people? I'm willing to drive so, for my country. Well, of course, and that's what we recommend. But I'm just telling you, it ain't that simple. 
and where, what's happening with all those ballots floating around. So at the end of the day, the systems become chaotic and complicated. And the goal is to, re let's starve the ballot boards by returning to the civic traditions that unite us, Democrats, Republicans, and people that we're trying to attract this season to vote for us. I hope my information was helpful to some of you. All right, Kim, I'll go over the second question. I don't know, I, I spoke about this earlier during our meet and greet with the representatives, but I don't know if you two are familiar with um, HF 3429. That was a bill passed in May of 2020, uh, prior to the 2020 election. And basically what it did is extended timelines of votes coming in and counting and allowed medical professionals to, to authorize, to oversee these votes and stuff like that. So I'll, I had two questions here, but I'll combine them into one. Since legislators determine election laws, what power do you, does the Secretary of State have in ensuring that only lawful ballots are counted? You want to talk about that bill? Yeah, well, yes, a little well, bit? You could, yes. Well, right. So COVID was used as a cover to do all the things I talked about before. Soccer box, the consent decree in Ramsey County Court, uh, and then changing the rules. So Simon went to the legislature that spring, all freaked out, oh, we're going to die if we vote in person, because he's always wanted to move us to a pure mail balloting system, which exists in about five other states. All we got from the legislature was an extension of the time when they opened the ballots to the seven days before it was 14 and, and a bunch of, he, he got accommodations because we were still trying to wrap our arms around this COVID thing, remember? That spring. And it was a very responsible legislative package. So the question is, what power does the Secretary of State have to enforce the law? Well, if that's his job or her job, uh, as the executive, as a constitutional officer. The Secretary of State also has rulemaking authority, and Simon has been abusing it left and right. If you talk to Senator Kiffmeyer, she's been very frustrated because there's a deviation between what the law says and what he tells election officials across the state and actually puts into the uh, official guides for county auditors and city officials. So even if I was the only person to win this year, I could take us back to following the laws on the books rather than abusing that rulemaking authority to twist uh, the electoral system. So there's a lot of discretion there uh, for the Secretary of State, absolutely. Kelly, did you need me to repeat the question? Um, I, I think I got it. So what we really need to do is we need to move our legislators to do their job. So the Secretary of State can do their job. At the core, that's the bottom, bottom line. The Secretary of State administers the law. They're not law enforcement, so they don't enforce the law. They can change the rules. We've, we've seen that. I think everybody would agree that our Secretary of State has been nothing but a, but a law twister. And he's used COVID as, as the cover. And we absolutely understand that. What we need to do is make sure we as citizens, we the people, are demanding our legislators to change and close the loopholes that are in the law right now. Words like may, it needs to turn to shall. I may come over tomorrow. You shall come home tomorrow. There's a difference, and every citizen knows that. But the challenge is, is that we have the ability right now to do something, because we can't wait until the 2020 election is over, because guess who's still the Secretary of State? <laughs> not us, not Kim nor I. The cheater is still in there. The lawbreaker is still in there. So we need to work with our legislators. Do you know what we need to really work with? We need to work to get our Republican candidates across the finish line. We have to have legislation because the legislature makes the laws and the Secretary of State needs to follow the laws. We've proven that through not having our voices heard in the legislature, 
it opens this all up for all this nonsense that happened. So yes, while that money poured in, and poured in and poured in and poured in, and the backroom deals, when we talk about conspiracies, do you know who's creating the conspiracies? It's the Democrats. They work by fear. They work by working you over by fear. They tell you that you have to have all, all this time for mail-in balloting. You don't have to comply with that. You've had the power all along to change that. But you know what? A lot of us have sat by the wayside. We have to get off our duck and get moving and make sure that we get our legislators elected and follow the law. All right, Kelly, uh, I'll ask you to go first this time. Okay. okay. Are you in favor of getting rid of computer voting and using <coughs> only paper ballots? Please explain why or why not. Well, number one, we need to get voting back to a local. It needs to get back local. It needs, we have to follow the chain of command. Right now, we know that anything that's hooked up to the internet has the ability to be hacked. This is, this is, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand this. We were hacked about six weeks ago. It's terrible. We have got to get back to the basics. One ballot, one vote, show up on election day, and if paper ballots are what the people want, and if that's what the legislature passes, absolutely. Absolutely. Why not? Well, right now, we don't own the House. And so that legislature, the way we, serve, the way we get around that is show up in force. You know, we talk a lot about Virginia. Well, culturally, Virginia is different than Minnesota. There's no doubt about that. Culturally, it's different. How did they do it? They got up and they showed up and they went out to vote in person. And that is what we can all do. And that's what every Republican, from Kim to me to everybody, I think we're all screaming that. I don't think we've ever heard you say, don't show up. None of us have ever said, don't show up. But that has to be the message. That has to be the message for not only you, but even your DFL friends. Because you know what? If all the ballots were counted, I don't think the blue ones would have enough to get across the finish line. That's why they cheat. So if we the people want to go back to paper ballots, then yeah, we should. Then we should, because you know what? Here's an interesting stat. There's 4.4 million driver's licenses in the state. 3.5 or 4 million-ish voters. Take out those people that are not eligible citizens and take out all the 16 and 17 year olds. And what have you got? You got a lot of people with voter ID already. There are so many things in our power that we could take advantage of. We the people need to get up, do more of this, and get out and do something about it. But if you want paper ballots, heck yeah, let's do it. Thank you. Minnesota votes with paper ballots. We already do. I think there's some confusion over this issue. The only people that don't use a paper ballot are those that need an accommodation for a disability. Have any of you ever voted with a voting card or electronically? No, they have that down in Georgia. I saw it when I was there for the US Senate runoff in January of 2021. <laughs> So we do vote with paper ballots. I think what people mean by that is they're deeply suspicious of the e-poll books that yes. they're shoving down our throats. And by the way, Biden just sent in tons of money. Check with your county auditor. They're shoving it into conservative counties like Ottertail Otter right now to make you sign in with an e-poll book instead of that good old fashioned voter registration. When I served on my city council for eight years, that's what we used. It worked. It works, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So what, is, what do the e-poll books do besides um, undermine our confidence? They give real-time uh, voter turnout data to the county or the Secretary of State or maybe Keith Ellison, who's keeping an eye on that and shouting, we need more votes. The other thing I think you're, what people mean by that suspicion, because we do use paper ballots, is the tabulator. Yes. State law says, the tabulators cannot be hooked up to the internet until the polls close at 8 o'clock. 
Well, guess what? Those things are live. And they're live all day long in places where the head judge is not following the law. So the answer is we do vote with paper ballots, but we become deeply suspicious of the technology. We are entrusting our most precious right as a self-governing people in a constitutional republic to technology we don't control, we don't understand. And let's face it, folks, it's government. Yeah. You know, as much as we may love our county officials and local officials, they're not competent to run these things. A friend of ours and a friend of Susan's used to be a mayor of uh, St. Bonnie. He hacked the uh, machines in about four minutes with his phone. Wow. So that's what I think you meant by paper ballots. But that is what we use, folks. Uh, we already have a couple Dominion machines, by the way, in the state. They're ESNS machines for the most part. My feeling is they have the same vulnerabilities as Dominion. So let's get rid of them. Hey, Kim, uh, you can, uh, this is my last question. Every Republican candidate that I've listened to in 2022 has discussed their plans to fix future elections, which is a good thing. But rarely does anyone say anything about what took place in 2020. How extensive do you feel that the fraud in 2020 was, and can anything be done about it? Do you believe that tampering with an election, attempting to subvert democracy, should be treated as a misdemeanor, a high crime, a felony, or treason? Put your questions in there. Um, you know what's interesting? That we refer to voter fraud as shenanigans. Yeah. Can we stop doing that? Yes. And calling it what it is. It's fraud. And, and it should be elevated. I mean, I would treat it as a felony. Uh, I would lock people up. And that's why I say, give me a great governor candidate, folks, if you're delegates. Give me a great AG who's got courage. Because one of the things I'm going to want to do is strategically prosecute voter fraud from the, you know, a person who cheats on election day pretending to be a citizen, um, or the person who is double dipping, maybe college students. Uh, there's a great deal of, of, of problems on Indian reservations. Uh, we've got big, big problems to address in the state. Uh, so we're going to need really brave folks. Because you know what's going to happen when we win? We're going to pass an amazing package of legislation, including voter ID, rolling back same-day registration, requiring provisional ballots, all of those things. And you know what the DOJ is going to do to us under the Biden administration, because we're stuck with them for two more years? They're going to sue us. What are they going to say Minnesota has done? Jim Crow 2.0. They're going to freak out. Remember what they did to Georgia? When they Yeah, we're a bunch of racists, right? Um, voter suppression and all of those things. So we're going to have to be strong, we're gonna to have to have tall, strong so, uh, shoulders. One of the things I've been doing is talking to people who are amazing, strong uh, litigators with experience in federal court and fighting the government. I got a couple buddies that I call my legal eagles. And I think I have at least one talked into taking a leave of absence for at least a couple of years till we get rid of the Democrats in the White House and start firing those DOJ lawyers because they're going to attack us and it's going to be vicious. Um, so, you, so the, I think I missed. You had like three questions well, in there. Yeah, just basically, how extensive do you feel the fraud oh, was in 2020, it was and do you believe anything can be done about what happened in 2020? You know what? It's amazing how many citizens. Like, let's just talk about Minnesota who are doing uh, a lot of digging into what happened uh, in 2020. Uh, the approach that I'll be taking to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, so we're in that Overton window with independent voters and the Democrats we need to win, is we're gonna talk about the rigging that we can prove uh, happened in 2020. Uh, it, will, it will sweep us into office, I believe, both here and nationwide. Uh, we use arguments that people can understand, and they should be morally outraged. But we have to stop being polite, folks, and call it what it is. They're not shenanigans. It's fraud, and it's the theft, it's the theft of our most important civic right, the right to fair and secure elections. Right. Right. Right.
if we're lucky enough to have either of you. But now we come to my problem. I look at local candidates time and time again, and your state candidates, you too, and there's one that I tend to like because I think the same way. There's another one who has a lot more clout with the people downtown and can maybe push us over the edge, maybe. But we haven't been too successful with that. My question would be, is why do you think that you have a better chance of winning? Who would like to go first? Who, who finished up last time? Uh, they go first. I finished. finished up. Okay. Did I finish? Last yeah, go ahead, Dylan. Or, you know what? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, you. John, do you mean between the two of us, there's a better chance of yes. winning? Yeah, I can't ask the other candidates. So, between the two of you, well, why do you think? Because uh, yeah. I want one of you to win. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do that. So, so as I said before, John, uh, um, I have a better chance of winning because I'm the one, frankly, with the deeper understanding of the election process. And I'm not just talking about me and my opponent. I'm talking about me and everybody else on the Republican slate. As I said before, they're focused on campaigning. We always do that, and we forget about how the election is run. And one of the things I promise you I'm going to do, and I've already started talking to the other statewide candidates and the congressional candidates, is how can we work together as a team, not just on marketing? Because we all know we're not gonna win if, it's, if we're just counting on Republican votes, right? We have to reach out to other groups. Like, I'll have an ad, for example, in the Russian-speaking newspaper this month. I've been in the Somali community. I've been in the Hmong community and, and, and others, and, and going into churches and so on and so forth. But I think I have a better chance because I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Simon and call him out. I don't think he's that great of a candidate. He's a smooth guy. He's been around the Capitol for a long, long time. But I have too. I'm well known in the legislature. I've lobbied in Congress, trying to kill Southwest Light Rail, by the way. Um, I've been around St. Paul, been around DC. I can draw an amazing network of experts to back me up. Um, and so it's all the, it's, it's for such a time as this, John, that my, you know, I don't need a job. The way I want you to think of me is I'm an outsider with an inside track. And I think I can use those credentials and those connections, not just to get me over the line, but to get the whole ticket over the line. Because they are going to cheat. But we know their playbook. I know it pretty darn well. Um, they're gonna throw something else at us too, by the way. Is it gonna be another plant? I mean, oh, yeah. oh yes. Oh yes. You know, what's Zuckerberg gonna do this time? But because I'm thinking about all those things and I'm not just marketing Kim as a candidate, I think I have the best chance to win and the best chance to help our entire ticket as we crisscross the state and we say to people, you don't have to marry us, you don't have to become a Republican. Just give us a chance to turn this thing around and you'll be amazed. Thanks, John, for your question. Well, I, I, while I appreciate that, I think it's really important that we have electable candidates. We need to have candidates that can actually reach out themselves to our communities of color that already have those credentials and actually have those real relationships in the business community. Those people that have those connections with the police and the fire where we can heal our community. How many of you are in favor of defunding our police? No hands. How many of you are in favor of our police? Okay. We need to have people that actually have a real marketing plan to market and not have any collateral damage that comes behind them. So my, my daughter is brown. Does anybody know that? My daughter's first language is Spanish. My nephew is black. My husband is an immigrant. We've been working on this for a long time. 
We have over 60 volunteers around the state right now. We have student groups because do you know who we need to bring across the finish line? We need to get the 18 to 35 year olds. We already have a faction of kids that are lined up and ready to go when school gets out. So when does school get out? When parade season begins. We need to get out into the community so that we can invite those people to vote for us. We need somebody on the ticket that is enthusiastic. While my opponent says that she's a political outsider, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Because you've been around this a very long time. You've been litigating with the, or, or using your lawyer skills with Center for the American Experiment and the Heritage Foundation and all the different things with this long list of, of politicking. And I will tell you this. You are going to need a candidate that can relate to people, that are going to invite them to come out to vote, to get on the phones for them. And that's what we've been doing since we announced in October. I know you've been speaking about election integrity for years, and that's amazing. But speaking about it, and writing a paper about it, and talking about it, and thinking about it, is different than doing it. And I'm tired of hearing that. We need a candidate that's gonna get up and go. And that's what we've been doing. Do you know how many Chamber of Commerce people are tired of the way things are going? I'm a business owner. They're ready to step up and help. But they need to get behind the right candidate, an electable candidate, one that's been working. All right, I'm Bob Seifert, uh, Pelican Rapids. Tell me something about your opponent that would make them a better candidate than you in the general election. I'll go first. I'll go first. I'm going to go right back to this point that I said. I don't like it when people say that somebody's better than somebody else. And I won't accept that. And as a candidate, if you accept candidates talking about, I don't know, somebody's got something ringing there, but yeah. 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 Okay. if you've got your phone ringing, you might want to it's shut it's it off. It's, it's not my job. Oh, it's I don't know who's dinging me, but somebody wants me to stop. <laughs> if we get off this point of beating up Republicans, we'll have more time to be Democrats. And like I said in the beginning, I know you're trying to be uh, flip this around to what does your candidate do that's better? I'm going to start right here. Kim has, a, has a, a law degree and I have a background in business. Intrinsically, we are different. And you as voters are going to decide. You as delegates will have the opportunity to decide who best meets your needs. And that's your private vote, and that's your private right. And so when I say, who is the better candidate, I'm going to flip it back to you. It's the one that you resonate with best, and the one that you feel, and you and you and everybody else feels, will best win. Because at the end of the day, neither myself nor Kim wants to lose. We didn't sign up for this to lose. We want to win. But ultimately, that decision is in your hands. You get to decide who you feel is the better candidate that fits your needs. Thank you. Bob, I don't think you got your, your question I answered. I didn't, and I would like an answer. Well, you know, I, I tend to agree with, with Kelly on, on that. You know, I get asked to endorse uh, other candidates day in and day out, congressional candidates, local races, that kind of thing. And my answer is always the same. Um, I respect the delegates. We have this caucus process, and um, if, if you get um, statewide candidates or CD chairs or whatever weighing in on it, then what the heck are the delegates for? 
why have you gone through this long process starting on caucus night and going up to uh, state convention? Uh, we're either respectful of that grassroots process or we're not. So I decline to uh, endorse people, even though it's very, very tempting. Um, and I just wanted to throw in, since I've got the mic, that um, I may be a lawyer. Uh, everybody hates them <laughs> until you need one. <laughs> and this position's unique. It's not the governor, it's not that, you know, the AG certainly should be a lawyer. Uh, but I think that is a unique qualification. And as for results, even though I am a lawyer, I, I think strategically, I'm actually a corporate lawyer. And instead of the 3,000 puny little election judge list that we had in 2020, we're up over 8,000 folks. And it's not because of me alone and my campaign to put eyes on any ballot, but patriot groups like yours, and finally the state party uh, is on board. Now the question was, what does Kelly have that, that, is, that, is, that would be helpful? For her in the she's, general election over so, science. So Kelly's a great speaker. Um, she's very enthusiastic. I think her background is this is Minnesota, and uh, and as a business coach, uh, serves her very well um, as a candidate. So I'll say that nice thing about um, my opponent, Kelly. My <laughs> <Right, laughs> is <laughs> Everybody has been able to see what your strengths are. You each have right. different strengths. We're unique. And I think each of you should be able to recognize what your opponent's strengths are also. So thank you for that answer. You're welcome. Good morning. Um, Kathy Collin, Fergus Falls. Not too long ago, we watched one of Minnesota's own. We'll go closer. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Not too long ago, we watched a Minnesota um, Congresswoman, Helen Omar. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Not too long ago, we heard. I'll get there. We watched Helen Omar not too long ago engage in ballot harvesting. What would you do if you saw this going on? and you knew it was illegal, and there was all kinds of press about it, it was in the news, nothing has ever been yeah. done about it. I know people are worried about being called Islamophobes, whatever else. Oh, I've been called that. <laughs> so, um, what would you do about it? Because I was, I was, it's hideous. It's, it's outrageous. Um, Repeat the question. Uh, Ilan Omar has a goon squad, you guys, in CD5. She has a goon squad. And she goes around bullying um, the Somali community and other people in CD5. By the way, a really good friend of ours just got endorsed, Cicely Davis, um, for to run against to run against Ilhan. And a beautiful Yay. Somali woman too, uh, who didn't get the endorsement, um, didn't endorse her, but she's gonna she's gonna help and she's gonna help my campaign as well. Because frankly, this a lot of Somalis are sick of being taken advantage of. Um, so, as I said before, give me a brave governor, give me a brave AG, and let's go after the fraud squad. Amen. I, I had a radio show, I paid for it with my own money in the fall of 2020. I saw the train wreck coming, folks, the 2020 train wreck. And I said, I've got to talk to people and beg them to be election judges and do other things. So I had a show called Wake Up Minnesota on 1280 AM, The Patriot, and I called her out. I called out Ilhan's Fraud Squad. And the people are so afraid because what happens? The corporate media punishes you. You get canceled. And it's vicious. But you know what, uh, folks, the time, for Minnesota at least, maybe our nation, it's run, we're running out of runway here. We've got to be bold. We've got to be brave. We've got to we've got to say that's fraud. That's illegal. In her case, she is she is a traitor to our nation. Yes. Right. Yes. She is a traitor to the great spirit of welcoming refugees to our country. Um, and uh, and we've got to call her out. I don't understand why she's still in Congress. Where the hell is Congress? 
Where's the, where's the FBI? Uh, where's law enforcement in Minnesota? That woman is broken, moralized, um, you know, from start to finish. And she mocks us. And she hates our nation. And I'm tired of it. And she, there's, but there's rat's nests all over Minnesota. I mean, where there's human beings, there's fraud. So no, I would not be afraid of Ilhan. I, I look forward to teaming up with Cicely Davis. Cicely's not afraid of Ilhan Omar either. And the, and the Somali community, when I was doing a Bonvino fundraiser, somebody knows Bonvino went here a couple weeks ago, a young woman from the Somali community came to me that night with her dad. She's gonna run for the house. And she said, we wanna work with you. After Ramadan's over, we want to introduce you to the Somali community. We're tired of being abused and we're tired of being fraud. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> great leadership, folks. Okay, let's hear your question. So, the question was is, is there ballot har was there ball ballot harvesting? Uh, what are we going to do about it? Is it widespread? Is that kind of covered? Well, I think well, if it was ballot harvesting, what are we going to do about it? Issues. How would you handle it if you knew what was going on? You saw people like there were no more. Well, we we if we don't need to see it happening right now because we know it's happening. We we know it's happening. I was actually when we were in CD five, I was talking to a delegate that lives in that community and actually witnessed this. Doesn't want to be identified because you can imagine it's a trusted person in the community. Okay, so first of all, we know the ballot harvesting is happening. We, we know that there's fraud. We know that this is a bully. But the one thing I want to call out right now is, is um, Shukri. Shukri was the Muslim woman in the Somali community that served our country 10 years, was not the endorsed candidate, but I don't think she's working on your campaign. Well, she offered. <laughs> oh, okay, that's interesting. I don't think she's working on your campaign. Um, I, I don't think she is. But, so that is a problem. The second thing is, is we cannot have, I think we just need to have uh, some bold-faced honesty here. So, I want to address something. The American experiment. The American Experiment is the organization that you worked for and that you were put on a 30-day paid leave for a racist comment because you said that they're not Norwegians. Now, I've never said anything about this, but I didn't, bring, I didn't open this can of worms. I have a problem. We are not all Norwegians. We are black, we are white, I have no Irish descent. My husband's from Ireland and he's an American citizen. And here's the scoop. There are a lot of people in that Somali community that resonate with us. But you know what? Right now, Republicans are just finally reaching out because they are scared. Can you imagine being in this community and, and the pressure that they're under? If you don't vote this way or you don't show up that way, there'll be repercussions. Can you imagine that? That's a problem. So I have a problem with somebody that is going to say one thing and kind of do another. And I'm a little shocked right now. I'm a little shocked on that one right now. And so I just want to run an honest campaign. And a flippant comment of she was Mrs. Minnesota and she's got some marketing background. I have run an entire sales department for a global hotel company with thousands of international employees. I speak a little French, a little Spanish, a little German, a little bit of American Sign Language, and we need somebody that can communicate and that's going to be transparent. And so, I will just promise you one thing. I'll work my guts out, I will communicate with people, and I'll do the best damn job that I can to get those voters of other colors, races, creeds, who are scared, but want, they came to America for a reason. Yep, some of them are here illegally. There's bad actors everywhere. But I think it's only fair if we really look at the facts.
going to say. Um, when it comes to Illinois, and it comes from people coming from say, yes, here, yeah. and it comes from pe having to do with people who come from an Islam country that is 99.9% .9 Sharia followers, I would like to think that our politicians are real careful in vetting those they connect with as to whether or not they would follow Sharia law or if they would follow the Constitution. Because we have a lot of people professing to follow in the Constitution and they are able to lie to us with what's called Takiyah Maruna or Kitman in order to further what their interests are, which is bringing the Hizra, the Catholic, to the West. Wow, she knows a lot. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kelly's comments? What, what Very quickly. Yes, please. So, whose comments were you addressing? Uh, Kelly's about me. I think this is important. Um, Minnesota has a lot of healing to do. Um, we are very, very united as a state, um, and, and you raised a tough issue, Kathy. Um, I was suspended from my job at Center of the American Experiment back in 2019, where I'd spent about a dozen years fighting uh, both the cultural and policy divide in our country. Um, because I dared point at that cultural disconnect. Uh, my comments made the New York Times folks were taken out of context. And I resigned from my job there because I had a, a reasonable people can disagree, right? And, and I, I disagree with the way that that got handled. Uh, I would say everything today that I said in 2019. Um, Minnesota is the number one destination for refugees in the country. We have been asked to do a great deal. And if we object to anything from other cultures, like polygamy or female genital mutilation, we are accused of being terrible people. So um, I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, I'll be talking about that more on the campaign trail. But Minnesotans have got a huge challenge in front of them to heal our state. We have to be able to have brave, honest conversations uh, in free speech, frankly, whether we're elected officials or private citizens. So let's do that together on a go forward and heal our state and get all these new folks introduced to uh, the great, uh, not just Minnesota culture, but American culture and the great American experiment in self-governance that it is. Thanks. Nick Crower, Newton Township. Now, you remember talking about paper ballots. 20 years ago when I went and voted, I went and voted in my town hall. It was a paper ballot that you slid in a box. Eight o'clock rolled around, the box was open, they counted it. Then they drove down to Fergus Falls and gave the numbers and they counted it. Now, I drive into town and I vote in the city hall, which Newton combined with and it goes into Newton's voting machine, which I understand must be turned on all the time because it's reading and it's buzzing and it's humming. And I heard from one of you that that's not legal. It can't be turned on until eight o'clock. The machine can be on. Yeah. Yeah. The machine can be on. I mean, hooked up, hooked up then. Okay. So then it's not on the internet until eight o'clock and then they hit a button? <laughs> and how, how would I know? I'm going to be an election judge. How would I know? Um, state law forbids the tabulators from being connected to the internet until after the polls close. But what election judges will tell you all over the state is that they're on. And this is part of what I'm going to ask the party to do. You know, the cities and the counties provide the training for our election judges, sir, but the party needs to supplement it with how to figure out stuff like that. 
I mean, we need to get, West Virginia just passed a law that you have to have double counting machines. They cannot have any internet capability whatsoever. Right. We need to get there. Because frankly, uh, hand counting, that's what the Democrats are great at with hand counting. Cheating. Mm -hmm. I'll just say it out loud. And Republicans in pockets across the country too. You know, they cheat too. So that's what we need to get to. But right now, I'm, in, I'm asking the Republican Party to work with long-standing Republican judges who worked like in the be in belly of the beast, and they've seen things like the uh, the Wi-Fi being on. It's the first thing the head judges do in Minneapolis is turn it on in the morning, right? There's a cradle sitting right there, and there are ways to figure it out, though it can be hidden. I mean, this is what I said before about why are we relying on technology for our most important civic right? Get rid of it. And we, and we gotta, yeah, we gotta get there. It's gonna take time to, to pull it out. So, but you're still voting in person. Right, right. Good. But I mean, now, okay, now if we got that problem solved, we've heard Rich Stanek talk about losing by 600 ballots yeah. and finding 4,000 bad. And the judge says, prove which ones it is. Right. So how in the hell do we have a choice of any of this? Well, what are the Is it time for the Second Amendment? Seriously, seriously, we look like lawyers and accountants. If you can't do this, what do we have to do? Do we well, have to take it into our hands? This is why Jefferson said that um, an honest franchise voting is the arc of safety because that's how we solve our differences. Otherwise, we get pretty angry and we start we start leading that way, right? And I was teaching uh, some homeschoolers uh, election law a couple years ago, and I said, what happens when the American people lose their confidence in the vote? And the girls said, well, we probably just won't vote that much. And the boys said, we'll get out our guns. <laughs> <laughs> People are different, right? The boys and the girls. We know how to define the boys and the girls. So we certainly have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of, we, we have fallen for the lie of technology yes. and absentee voting, and let's starve that system this year, move to in-person voting, and try to bring as much integrity to that process as we can. So, so then you're saying that there's, are we, are we, yeah. I, I love yeah. it, I love this question. There. Yeah. Yeah. You go ahead. So, you know, your question, I'd love, I'd love for you to repeat it because there was a lot of, there was a lot of conversation back and forth. So your, your ultimate question was really. Well, the ultimate question is if we can understand that one guy lost by 600 ballots. Right. And he found 4,000 bad and the judge says for which ones it is. How do we fight that? Is that really true? So you can never redo an election? So the one thing that we can do is show up in person. So I want to talk about election judges because that was a, a question because you said you were an election judge, right? Right, I'm okay. trying to be. You're trying to be, okay. So as I was calling delegates, this is what I found out. It was just the luck of the draw. I had called four delegates in a row and all four of them were election judges. Three of them said they'll never do it again. Why? Are you all curious why they would never do it again? Because they were the only person put into an area with a whole bunch of DFLers. Yeah. How would you feel as a volunteer? You don't want to show up like that, right? Oh, I'm wondering. I wouldn't be there. I'm not afraid. I'm from Indicare, so I believe in our Second Amendment. You know, what do they say? The First Amendment and Second Amendment, they should be going hand in hand. This is what we really need to do. We need election judges. And yes, we fell short. Both of us agree that the Republicans fell very, very short. You can't have 3,500 election judges and 20,000 DFL election judges. What could possibly go wrong with that? All right. Right? So having election judges is great. They need to be well trained. Many people ask me, these three that I'm talking about that said they would never uh, do that again, I want to address why they would never do it again. Because they were the only person there, they were intimidated, 
One of them became the janitor, was set up to wipe down the, you know, the, uh, the poles and everything. And the last one, the third one, didn't really know what she was looking for. Shame on us for not jumping in with our own election judges and teaching them what, we, what, what they need to know. So here's the good news. The good news, because there is good news, the good news is, is our election judges' numbers are going up. There's around 8,500-ish now. We need to get at least to 15, you know, they have 20,000. But here's the scoop. We can have eyes on every ballot. We need to have eyes on your ballot. I know that dinger is going off, but there was a lot of back and forth sure. conversation, so okay. I'm going to take you another. Up, it's five years before, so yep. she, we're going to let her. Yep. I'm going to take it just a minute because there was a back and forth sure. conversation, and I want to finish my point. Yeah, just so she gets her point. Yep, that's perfect. Kim, you'll stick around for the last question. Good? Good. Okay, we're in agreement. So if we can stop the dingers, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> See? Technology, it'll screw you up every time. <laughs> What's the plan? for training these election judges. If you go to the Secretary of State's office and sign up to be election judge, are you confident that, that you'll get trained? No. We have a plan to work with the Republican Party to make sure that our team is in shape and trained. The challenge is, is that if you learn how to be an election judge in June or July, are you gonna remember by November? No, we better have a very good training program for our people. We have to do that. Another thing that our campaign did that nobody's talked about, and this is, this is something that y'all should be thinking about, is this DFL liaison. Y'all know what that is? On caucus night, we all know the Democrats have invited everybody and their uncle out to come and caucus with them. Convicted felons, ineligible voters, underage people, all that. We were the first campaign to call out Steve Simon. Do you know why? I wanted to just see if he'd get a response because he's the quiet guy. He never responds to anything. He just makes his own rules. So we called him out and he did actually respond to us. You know what he said? He did not have the authority to challenge that caucus night issue. Then they came, which is weak leadership. And I don't know how many of you are sick of weak leadership, but I am. Raise your hand if you're sick of weak leadership. So when we called him out and did that, that was great. The next thing they did was they put in this DFL liaison program. And you can go right to the DFL website and see what it is. It's a marketing program to get people to schmooze and cozy up to these election folks in the counties, the clerks, everywhere. And right in their speak, it says, so that we can achieve our plan. Or achieve our, no, it says achieve our goal. <coughs> well, what's their goal? <coughs> to win by any means, including cheating. So we thought, you know what, let's put it out and see how many people would sign up for a Republican liaison program. And within 24 hours, we had 36 people that signed up. Pretty good. I don't know if they're all really, you know, Republicans, so we had to do a little check. Yep, there are people we know. And within another short period of time, we got up to 45. What does that tell you? There's 45 people that are willing to go out to a county and at least follow and see what the DFL is doing. I don't know if we've ever done that before. I know we never have done that before. But the fact of the matter is, is we can do nothing unless we have well-trained election judges. Because if you show up and you're the only one there, you can't do anything. You're gonna be the janitor. So the plan needs to be they should at least go out two by two or three by three. There should be some you know, uh, there, there should be some teamwork. Right. Because I don't want to be the only one in downtown Minneapolis. We're stronger together. Mm -hmm. My point is this. We have got to take action. We've got to have well-trained election judges. We have to encourage everyone to get out to vote in person. And when we do that, we'll have the opportunity to win but we can't sit on the sidelines anymore. There's so many pieces to this whole election puzzle and it's not gonna get sorted out until we win. And that has to be our primary focus. Okay, last question, Kelly, you can, you can go first. Add two minutes each <coughs> for these last questions and then that, that, those are the last questions. I've got three really short ones. Two of them are just kind of a clarification. <laughs> 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 
3429 on the absentee ballot extension thing or unlimited? Does that sunset in 2021 or did it not? 2020. Right. So, so just when, they look, when the legis look for this, when the legislature let out, Kim mentioned it earlier. I know. Get ready for the lawsuits. They're coming. There's going to be some fly in the ointment that they're going to come up with that is going to try to thwart people from getting out. See, the Democrats, you all know this, I think. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, I, I hope I'm pre I really hope right now I'm preaching to the choir. Yep. You all know we have the answers. You have to show up. But we have been, you know, this whole COVID piece has been a, it's a test. Let's see how far we can go. Let's see how far we can go. Let's mask up our kids. Let's tell you, you gotta have a vaccine before you can even be an election judge. It's a test. Stop taking the test. Stop taking the test. Yeah. Yes. So at, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, whatever questions you want to bring forward, it's we the people. We have got to stop thinking that, oh, everything is so complex in this big universe. It is complex. But if we take the simplest step and be we the people and exercise our right to vote, it is, it, it is not just that simple, but it is just that simple. Be an election judge. Get well trained. Only vote in person. Tell your friends, even if they're DFL. You know what, why don't you use the same tactic on your DFL friend? How many of you have a DFL friend? How many have that one friend? Come on, raise your hands. Don't be a bunch of babies. Okay. How many of you have a relative that's not talking to you anymore? There we go, that's what we should have asked, right? Okay, so there's the better question. Why don't we use the same thought process that, that's been used on us? Why don't we say, you know what? How do you know your vote's coming? You know what, let's go together and let's vote. Because that way we'll know how many votes really there were if we're in person. That is what we have to do. It is our civic duty. If you can go to the bar, if you can go to Starbucks, if you can go bowling, you can get up and get out to vote. And that will end our voter, voter season if we choose not to participate. Thank you. Go for it. I forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that they were talking to that those to be election judges would have to be vaccinated, but that hasn't fully come through yet. Apparently. For count for county employees, right, right now Ramsey and Hanukkah, but it'll spread. Just watch. Well, but stay tuned. But you asked about the 2020 legislation to accommodate COVID, but also probably the consent decree that Steve Simon signed uh, with Mark Elias. So two things. Um, the 2020 consent decree that violated the Constitution, by the way, and that's not Kim Crockett, that's the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals saying that, um, expired by its own terms in 2020, but he's trying to extend, he's trying to get all those things in the legislature right now. He's over sweet talking uh, in the House. And Kim Meyer just hammers him when he comes over to the Senate, and it's glorious to watch, by the way. It's good theater. Um, but he's, he's also arguing for more than 46 days of voting. And he's arguing to take the 2020 accommodations that he got from the legislature when we were in the midst of, we didn't know what the Chinese had sent us, right? He's trying to get those into permanent status now. And he's not gonna get it through the Senate, but this is why it's so critical that we take back the legislature and roll all that back. Now, I was asked to be on, uh, a, it was an unofficial task force with key legislative leaders in the House and the Senate before they went into session in January. We've got legislation lined up, moving through the Senate right now, through the hearings, that'll be ready to go in January of 2023. In the House, it's just commie bill. You know, they're proposing that 16-year-olds should be able to vote. And, yeah. You know, you know, they're ready to say non-citizens should be able to vote over in the House. It's just a complete Marxist takeover. Yeah. So the answer is he's trying to extend everything he got using COVID as a cover 
permanently into law. And this is why we need to defeat him. And you're going to help us do it. Yeah. Is there any um, truth to you? Uh, someone made a statement, not here, but that if you vote later on the day, on election day, you're, uh, they, can't, they can't cheat as quick, or they just don't know how many they're going to need of votes if you vote later. Well, there's a, there's a, there's, this is something I debate with friends in other states. There's a strategy out there that if you go so early, you've covered your own ballot and pulled it out of being able to cheat. Um, I still lean toward start the ballot boards and go vote in person in Minnesota. Our situation here is a little, is, is unique. Um, so that's a debate that's going on nationally in my group. But I still say, let's return to the civic traditions. And Kelly had a great idea, which is if you live with those people in who aren't speaking to you, who have Trump derangement syndrome or whatever it is that's troubling them, uh, if you live in the same precinct, yeah, do go vote. Go vote together. Or, you know, propose to your Democrat friends and family, let's all go vote this morning, bright and early, and then meet for lunch, or something like that. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of different strategies out there now. Thank you for your here's, question. And your answer to the, um, you know, to the second is what time you vote. Well, here's, a, here's an interesting one. I voted in, at, you know, early in the morning when I was on the ballot, and my, you know, the, the name wasn't tied back to voter history. So the biggest point is go and vote in person. There's no disagreement in the universe off of that one. Go vote in person. What have you learned today? Go vote, vote in person. person. And yes, go take your DFL friend with you. Don't talk about what you voted about. Go over coffee, and then you can go personally celebrate the results this fall. Let me ask you one thing together. No matter who wins on primary, would you support the other and endorse the other? Both very good. Well, we both agreed to abide by the endorsement, so unless somebody else enters the race, there's no primary. So whoever gets the endorsement on Friday, May 13th in Rochester will be the candidate on the ticket uh, in the general. I'm running against Steve Sonson. Yeah, we need, we, need this, we need this seat. You're all here, I think, for a reason, because you really want to see election integrity. We all do. There's no disagreement. And that is where we've got to stop. We have got to get together on this whole idea. Not Kim nor I would disagree on that. We have got to win this fall. And the only way we're gonna do that is if you get out and do your job, and that is vote in person on election day and bring whoever you want with you as long as they're a legal citizen and they're eligible to vote. <laughs> vote. <laughs> Thank you, guys.